Hello, Welcome, Melody. everyone. Hello, Javi, and hello, everyone. How are you? Are you tired already, or do you are you excited and would, would just want to keep Rick's rights gone going for one more, two more weeks? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm excited, but I'm also tired. I'm not going to lie. I think <laughs> RightsCon is always super intense, but the whole of Access Time now team, I think, uh, would probably kill us if we were uh, putting a motion to extend <laughs> RightsCon. <laughs> well, that is that is an implied shout out to the RightsCon team, which has been amazing, and the rest of the Access Now team, who has been working crazy for this event, right? Of course. And so maybe you can share with us what has been one of the highlights of uh, the, the summit for you? Well, it's been a, a very exciting conference, a very interesting conference, a lot of learning always. I'm never tired of, of, of all the, the, you know, the big spectrum of the learning that we have. But if I have to pick a favorite, I would say that the social hours with the little tables that you could just jump around and meet new people were very, very cool. I mean, I really like that, that interface. Uh, you know, civil society connecting with funders, connecting with the private sector, I think that is, Amazing. It's like a mini reproduction of the hallway experience uh, that we always have in the in-person event. That, that was great. And what about you? What's your, your highlight? I was going to say the social hours too. Maybe we should have uh, <laughs> synced up before. <laughs> but no, uh, honestly, me, I felt challenged. I think there were a number of uh, panels and strategic sessions that I've attended that were really solution oriented. It wasn't just about debating about the ideas, but really trying to to find solutions and realistic solutions. And I really appreciated uh, that aspect. Like it wasn't too pessimistic, uh, but it was sometimes, you know, like a bit like hardcore realistic. Uh, and I guess that was a good summary of my, of my experience this year. But um, what I'm super excited about as well is uh, this closing ceremony and what we have prepared for you. And Javi, do you want to hand over to what's coming out next. Yeah, we have an amazing panel now. And again, thank you very much for being with us. Stay with us for this great panel and passing over to Brett. And like that, we just keep going with the final stretch of RiceCon. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Javi and to, to Melody. I agree, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that uh, after a pretty intense week where we're coming to a close <laughs> and uh, I feel really good about the discussions that we've had. I'm not really sure where the last five days have gone. I'm, I'm, I'm totally honest. I feel like I've how many hours I've been sitting in front of this screen um, in and out of panels and community labs and strategic roundtables. Um, I want to pay special tribute to the person who joined the dark patterns panel um, whilst on a treadmill. Shout out to whoever you are. Um, but, but seriously, I also want to note all those people who joined um, with a RightsCon grant. I think there were 151 of you uh, who came with a stipend um, provided by the conference and uh, costs like data and others, costs and expenses that were attached to um, participating in RightsCon. So hopefully that worked out well. It's the second time we've done that. Um, but it's not just been five, five, days of mind expanding sessions and challenges and new concepts and old struggles. It's also, I think, important to hold space for um, the 18 months of crisis that really has befallen so many of us. And I want to acknowledge the issues of digital authoritarianism that's been discussed so much during the week and crumbling democracies and intensification of state power and the like, um, you know, which is the lived experience of so many on the line. I think some of you know that we run a digital rights executive directors meeting every year. Uh, we just had it today. We had about 45 executive directors from around the world meeting to talk about the issues that we're facing as organizations of civil society. And I want to actually bring up um, three um, amazing members of civil society, um, Benga and Mariam and Xiao Wei, if you guys could all wave, that would be great. Uh, now that we're here on screen. Um, and I'd actually, before we begin this discussion, and I'm not calling it a panel because it's not a panel because we've already had 530 of them, uh, to, to just take a moment um, like Ten Mosey did yesterday in her session before she kicked off and just had a second of just calm and a second of just breath. 
because it has been an intense five days, but it's been an even more intense 18 months, as I mentioned. And I think it's important just to hold space for a sec. So we actually deliberately invited you three, um, intentionally invited you three. People might know that we actually began RightsCon with a multi-stakeholder panel, which had a representative of civil society and the corporate sector and, and of government. But we've actually have three representatives of civil society for, for the closing. And Nikki and I did that because um, we wanted to make sure that, that, that RightsCon which actually is the civil society space. It's a civil society owned space and it's a civil society owned multi stakeholder space in the sense that it, we invite governments and companies and other stakeholders into our environment. And I think it's only fitting therefore that we actually close and conclude these five days with three representatives of civil society. The other thing that I wanna say just before we kick off is that I would be really good in the opening we talked about the first um, about the 10 years of RightsCon, the 10 year anniversary. Uh, and in a sense, we look back and we look to the present. In our closing discussion, I'd like to talk about the next decade. I'd like to think, I'd like you three to think more about what's coming to prepare us as civil society and as the, all the other stakeholders who are here as to what you think is going to happen over this this period to think prophetically. So Benga, if it's okay, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you've been in this game for a number of years and we've kind of grown grey together, although it looks like I've grown greyer than you, to be honest. Um, you've seen the evolution of, <laughs> you've seen the evolution of digital rights, um, you know, from your own country, including the one of multiple crises that are happening on the continent with respect to Twitter and Nigeria. Um, and, 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 and so I guess my question for you is like, what does the, the current situation that you find yourself in and your country in, and in fact your continent in, although obviously it's a big call to ask about the whole continent, but what does that your current situation portend for the future? And, and, and what's your thinking on what's to come? Thanks, Brett. Uh, thanks for hosting this, and thanks to the entire Access Now team, and you know, to everyone making this happen. Uh, like you said, it's been you know an interesting few days in Nigeria specifically because you know, ironically, we actually just you know a few days uh, you know before the, the announcement by the government that they were going to suspend Twitter, we had just wrapped up on shooting our 2020 one-shot film based on our 2020 uh, annual report by Prada Majority on digital rights on the continent. And the things we talked about included shutdowns, you know, lack of access, government overreach, and things like that. Uh, and so when that happened, you know, it became something within the team that we said, okay, you know what, we were ready for this. And I think what is important though, is to say that the, you know, the suspension of Twitter in Nigeria uh, and many activities like that, that we've seen by government, either in Uganda or Ethiopia, anywhere else on the continent, is not just about, you know, in this case, Twitter or social media. It is actually a continuation of what is, you know, a clamp down agenda, uh, a closure of, you know, civic spaces. And, and, and the challenge with that, uh, you know, speaking of over the next few years, my, the, some of the concerns that I have include the fact that we're now beginning to see retroactive laws that are being used to justify, you know, undemocratic actions. So basically, uh, if you talk about actions by government uh, as being undemocratic, then you check the books and you find that they're actually making excuses for them in the books, like the Nigerian government announcing that, you know, OTTs now have to register and then taking that instead of going to parliament to have a report debate, uh, they're sort of escaping that and making announcements through an agency of government. And, and I, you know, also sort of get, I'm a bit concerned about, you know, not just governments, uh, but also the platforms themselves uh, in terms of context. You know, I, I saw a tweet by Access Now earlier today that I retweeted about how social media, how Facebook was muting, you know, the voice voices of Palestinians. And, and I thought, you know, it's important for us not just to talk about, you know, the worries about what governments are doing, 
but also the need for platforms uh, and other stakeholders to understand context and not, you know, contribute to the problems that are on the ground. But it's it's not all gloom for me when I look at the next, uh, say, 10 years. I'm actually I'm more optimistic about the next 10 years uh, than, than, you know, than have concerns. I know for a fact, you know, that yes, the, you know, the clash we're seeing between, say, you know, as someone has described it, nation states and cloud nations will get more intense. But the good news is that the citizens, the people will win because there will be pressure on one side on governments, there will be pressure on the other side on cloud nations. And we will have a scenario where citizens begin to call out governments, regardless of where they are. Um, you know, in the global south, or if you're acting as a dictator, you will be called out by citizens. If you're in the global north and you claim that you're, you know, you're a democracy that is also calling out other people, you will be called to question. Uh, you know, scenarios where we have, you know, Julian Assange or Edward Snowden being, uh, you know, t you know, being handled in their own countries or by, you know, countries like the U.S. and others, and then the same countries like the U.S. then says to other countries that, you know, what you guys should do better. That kind of hypocrisy, I'm sure we will see that go you know, down over the next few years because we will have, you know, pushback by citizens. And, and for me, I think that, you know, one other optimistic thing is we will see that, you know, debate is beginning to come up about platforms versus protocols. You know, uh, while we were chatting earlier, I said that my background in engineering really gets me excited about this time. Uh, because unfortunately, because we have platforms that are driven by commercial value, uh, we do not have, you know, that interest where they're focusing more on providing solutions and building around norms, uh, but they're focused a lot more on profit. But I believe that will change uh, as that conversation continues. But the most exciting thing for me is the fact that the more repression we see, the more citizens are learning what to do on how to push back. When governments shut down, people learn about VPNs and things they never really knew anything about. So I think over the next 10 years, we have a major opportunity as civil society to take advantage of every clampdown as opportunities to create awareness about tools, not just for circumvention, but also to empower citizens to push back so that the new normal does not become a situation where governments clamp down and people keep quiet. So, Brett, I'm excited about the next 10 years. Uh, I know things are really tough right now, uh, but I'm glad that we're sort of developing our wings to fly better. Thanks, Benga. Um, you know, I think that the, the situation is very mixed, as you say, and, and I, I love the way that you kind of are framing a negative and turning it into a positive in the sense that, you know, we're seeing this extraordinary consolidation of, of state power. Um, thanks for bringing up the idea of retrospective legislation uh, as well in order to legitimise the power of the state. And we're seeing that across the world, really. And just look what's happening in India, for example, with this like spate of new legislative developments that trying to reauthorise and reauthorise the state's power. Um, I. I also um, um, believe that this idea of um, civil society connections, civil society cross-country, cross-nation learning um, uh, and is essential. We're seeing, as you mentioned with shutdowns, the way in which civil society organisations are using precedent in one country as the basis of the positioning and power in another country. Uh, and 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 so, um, with that, maybe I should hand over to to Mariam to have a discussion um, about her perspective on this, because similarly, the the current situation does not look great. Um, and I know, as a Palestinian activist, uh, and this issue uh, has been on the agenda very much all week. Uh, and all month and obviously for many years. Um, but as a Palestinian activist, you know, you've, I've seen you on CNN, I've seen you reported in The Guardian and on a range of different platforms. And you have a really good understanding of the situation uh, of technology, of colonialism, of, of oppression. In fact, even, you know, Twitter's come up a few times already, but your account, your own account was restricted in, uh, in May of this year. So tell us, Mariam, about your perspective on where you think power will lie 
Um, you know, is it going to be in the hands of of governments? Will it be in the hands of companies? Or as Benga kind of pointed to, do you think that we as citizens will be able to re-exercise um, our digital rights with with some level of dignity? Um, well, thank you, first of all, Brett, um, and my fellow panelists, who I see all of us kind of nodding at certain instances at the same time, just because the experiences of a lot of the repression we're seeing, I think, resonates across um, the globe. <coughs> Excuse me. And for, for me, being based in Palestine, I was able to see the tangible repercussions of how things like social media platforms um, can impact our daily lives, can impact the extent of uh, violence we see um, and participate. And what I've been saying is social media platforms that have been censoring Palestinians trying to report and show their testimonies of the violence from Israeli settlers here is aiding and abetting um, apartheid and persecution. It is not mere censorship. And I really think it's so important that we are having these conversations now and that we continue to have them as a first step to kind of highlight the gaps or the opportunities there are to, to grow and develop. A lot of what I've seen on social media is the way we've been using it was um, to mirror our realities on the ground, to kind of extend and reflect that violence, that the colonial ethnic cleansing, the apartheid, um, and the, the very, uh, it's, it's just brutal, brutal uh, slaughter of, of Palestinians, like we saw in Gaza, which was carpet bombed, um, is that we look at it as mirroring the reality, but these conversations are showing how these um, th these these corporations and companies and platforms can also shape it. That right now, I think presently across the globe, we are seeing how transparency can take so many different levels. Accountability can take so many different levels and that everyone has a role to play. So when you ask me, Brett, um, who do I see kind of the, the centralization of power in? I see people calling for checks and balances where the, there is more of a decentralization that as long as you have transparency and you have accountability um, and, and policies that are clearly um, created to be implemented at the human rights level, well, then it's really the question is less about that and more about how can we make this happen? How can we ensure more transparency of what kind of pressures people are facing to kind of delete tweets? or why accounts are being suspended, such as mine, when I was tweeting out um, updates from on the ground in Palestine as the Israeli army was firing at unarmed Palestinian protesters. My account was suspended and I was under the impression that, you know, our words are at least getting out, that sure we're being shot down, but at least we get an echo. And then I find out that none of, um, my, my tweets and updates from the ground were shown, that they were censored. But what's worse is that the answer to that was, I'm sorry, it was an accident and it was reinstated by Twitter. And if, if we are having accidents, quote unquote, at this frequency, then there are things that really need to be worked on. So let's unpack this. Let's have real and, and true transparency, because I think right now there's an opportunity to set the bar higher in terms of justice, in terms of accountability, in terms of preserving human rights, rather than trying to understand um, the, the ways of which this is obstructed, let us recreate it. And I think that the social media platforms ahead of us, the technology that is growing around us is a testament of how much we can do when we imagine different ways. So this is also an imagination. Uh, if I might, I might just follow up. Thanks for your for your comments. And um, you know, there's a lot of focus right here on on social media companies, which I think is right. But I think it's also important that we think about 
the fact that every company over this next 10 years will essentially become a tech company. It doesn't matter what they're selling. And we've seen, you know, um, cosmetic companies are now, you know, selling facial recognition. Like, you know, who would have thought that L'Oreal would have been engaged in, in this? Um, so we need to, I think, as civil society, we need to expand our scope as well. Um, it's not just about expression now. We're talking about opinion, association, privacy, information, but across um, the spectrum from civil and political rights through to economic, social and cultural rights, as was discussed, I think, in the, the panel with the Special Rapporteur and the Secretary General uh, yesterday of Amnesty International. And so you also touch on the issue of, of transparency, which is great, um, and also implementation of transparent policies, you know, that we're actually, as you say, setting a, the bar higher and ensuring that that bar is actually implemented um, you know, as a floor, as opposed to the, as a ceiling. So, very much appreciate, uh, very much appreciate that. And and and, is there like when you think about civil society and its role in kind of setting that bar or enforcing, you know, the level of where that bar is set? Like, how do you see us activating? Like, how do you see us, in a way, taking what Benga said, which is like situation and then turning it into a positive so we're actually spreading our wings and learning how to fly when the next situation happens and i think that's an excellent question i think a lot of um the solutions are within the problem right we are finally able to name a lot of these problems that we otherwise couldn't um and now we are also moving towards solutions so for you know palestinians um in terms of the the, the censorship, I'm going to go back to this as an exa example, on social media showed that there's no real understanding within these tech companies that they are not really investing in researchers that can show you the word martyr should not be flagged as incitement and censored. Martyr means um, a person who was killed by the Israeli army, by this colonial power. But more than this, martyr in its linguistic form means to bear witness. Um, so to, those that were killed are those that are witnesses <coughs> to slaughter. So it's, it's looking at it at the very micro level. It is empowering the employees to speak out when they see um, corporate policy that violates human rights. Um, so we need to ask ourselves on that level as well. It is sharing digital rights um, platforms. It is simplifying these uh, terms that we all have to kind of sign up for at the end that no one really reads. Let's actually give people access to information instead of hiding it behind kind of the jargon of the words. Let's simplify it. And I think more than anything, what this current period showed us is just how intelligent we are as people and how quickly we can learn things about um, different sectors that we otherwise didn't. So let's also trust people um, in their knowledge in their intelligence and in their right to access information uh, and actually give it to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, really encouraging to hear. And I also just want to shout out to, uh, as I did in the opening, there are 500 tech companies that have been uh, at RightsCon over this week and, you know, representatives from Twitter that have sat down with uh, representatives of civil society. Uh, I think it's a a learning exercise in many of the companies as well. I think there is actually quite a lot of goodwill and a lot of thinking about how to improve the situation. Um, um, we also need to make sure, of course, that the companies that are not here are engaged in this discussion because when we think about that evolution of technology over the next 10 years, we are, and now, we're talking about facial recognition. We're talking about digital identity. And we're talking about biometric tracking and biometric surveillance in, in public spaces. Um, and these matters are absolutely relevant, I think, um, to our next um, speaker, Zhao Wei. It's great to have you here and thanks so much for joining us. You actually have got really significant insights into, uh, into China. And China is actually, you know, when we think about the next decade, I'm interested in your thoughts about you know, is this going to be China's internet decade? Um, you know, expand exporting of assets, infrastructure and digital policy 
through to you know Benga's region uh, and to Mariam's region and 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 actually in standard setting bodies and so on. Um, you know, you've written an extraordinary book, Blockchain Chicken Farm, and other stories of tech in China's countryside, which has been reported widely. And I think you know, sort of addressing this idea of storytelling as well and how do we actually tell stories and narratives about what we see and being prophetic about what we expect to see and also what we hope to see. So let me hand over to you and, and let's have your thoughts. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone at RightsCon and Access Now for having me and to the other panelists. Um, yeah, I think that's the question of the next decade in China brings up a lot of really interesting themes. One is this idea that it might be the end of the West and that it's China's rise. And then another common theme really is this fear of China's rise. And I think within fear, there's also this notion of safety. And so something that's on my mind for the next 10 years is how do state actors define safety and security and how do they co-opt this narrative? Um, you know, when I think about China right now and especially biometric surveillance um, and widespread oppression, especially against the Uyghur Muslim population in Xinjiang, um, these human rights abuses are you know really enabled by technological surveillance like that region has uh, this like next level um, ID cards that have retina and fingerprint scans um, and so really though this kind of you know the state actors there are saying that you know this surveillance is out of public safety and so I think this question of how we're defining safety, at the state level versus really on the ground is going to become crucial. Uh, even outside China, when I think about things like you know, COVID, uh, you know, public safety and tracking uh, issues like that. Um, I think another issue about the kind of US-China uh, relations, this kind of tech Cold War narrative, um, there's also uh, a lot embedded in there, and especially the differing levels of power. Um, so, you know, I think about the heartbreaking circumstances of Xinjiang a lot, and it's also, you know, I'm currently in the Bay Area. I think about, uh, you know, what is to be done, and for within, you know, U.S.-China politics, there's this attempt at policy at the governmental level to really change things. But then you have tech companies uh, kind of off to the side and they're really banking on nationalism and deregulation. And that's kind of resulting in this new set landscape of kind of uh, non-collaborative, non-cross-culturally collaborative um, set of AI ethics. Not to mention many of these tech companies have global supply chains, global talent, um, and it's really actually a kind of global level issue. Um, so the Cold War rhetoric is, um, you know, really serving a specific class of people. I think mm. I will say I have a lot of optimism, though. Um, so when I think about uh, there was a session earlier where this researcher, Julian Posada, mentioned ethics from below. And so when workers at tech companies or in uh, data training companies, uh, they start to, you know, really make change. Um, I just finished stewarding this place, uh, Logic School, which is uh, for tech workers, um, not just engineers, but also gig workers, platform workers, um, to really think through how they might bring organizing and activism into their companies. And I, it was really inspiring um, and truly powerful to see a group of, you know, 20 folks from some of the biggest tech companies to gig workers uh, start to really actively organize and make change. And so I feel very inspired by that. Mm. Thank you. Th thanks so much for your comments. I, I want to pick up on a couple of them and maybe we can get all four screens uh, up on the big screen because I think that um, we'll, we'll finish up shortly because I'm conscious that we, um, you know, that we've all been here for a long week. Uh, but I do want to just uh, pick up on a few things that you said and then maybe we can have a little group discussion and then we'll hand over to 
the extraordinary Nikki Gladstone to, to bring us home on this issue of safety and security and how it's defined by both the state and also by, by companies. And um, how, when I look at the digital security helpline that Access Now run, has r- runs, and we've just put out our re- latest report on, you know, 10,000 cases, we've done 10,000 cases. And there's sort of the difference between digital security and safety and, and national security and safety and national and cyber security, in a sense, the way that the state understands it and how those two things uh, are really, um, um, you know, almost speaking different languages, certainly speaking different languages. If you look at, for instance, on, on, um, on internet shutdowns, you know, the number one reason that is actually given for, for shutdowns is around public safety. But actually, the way that we see it is that it's actually about the right to peaceful protest. And, and, and governments are, uh, deliberately miss um, um, characterising citizen voices on exercising the right to peaceful protest and talking and shutting down the internet because they're seeing it as, as, an, as an affront to, to their own authority um, rather than expression of citizen will. Uh, I also wanted to touch on this idea of the tech Cold War, uh, which is not just between China uh, and the US, but actually is in this next decade, I think there's going to be a further intensification as states, you know, try to bring digital sovereignty back into their purview so that they're putting their data centres within the country and so on. Um, And, you know, it's really a tectonic shift of this geopolitical development between, you know, the borderless internet um, powers trying to re- reassert control and, of course, have supremacy in the digital age um, in terms of diplomacy and control. So, um, um, but you're positive as well. And I think that that is so pleasant um, and, and probably that's the wrong word, but it's inspiring and it's engaging. And I I want to pay tribute to, to you three, but I also want to pay tribute to all of the other civil society representatives who are here at RightsCon and th- those who haven't made it to RightsCon who are battling, you know, so many of these forces. Like, and so I guess my last, well, my question is, um, you know, what is your message to civil society that could actually take us through with confidence and to share that inspiration that you guys have um, when they're faced with a new law and their coalition is being built and a law is being you know, read in second reading speech in a parliament and the first time you've seen it uh, on biometrics, what can, you, what can you convey to them about um, the pathway that they should take? Um, I, I personally was listening to an extraordinary panel with um, um, Mawa and Wafa and, um, and another uh, woman from the, from the MENU region and they're all so inspiring in the way that they have, are facing, you know, real life harms, um, but are yet so powerful and engaged with their work. So, um, Benga, can I jump to you first? Um, and if you'd like to comment on any of your previous um, discussants uh, uh, comments, please feel free. All right. Uh, thanks, Brett. Um... I'm glad we're having this conversation and I'm glad that we're not, you know, leaving this place, uh, you know, feeling sad uh, because to be honest, a lot is going on. Uh, but, but maybe three quick things for me that civil society can learn uh, as we navigate our way through the complexities, uh, you know, to, to, towards solutions and towards better uh, scenarios. I think number one for me is to keep records. Keep records. Um, and, and I think this is important because if we don't document history, we won't learn from it. And it becomes very easy for governments and other actors to change the narrative. Practical example, October 2020, young Nigerians went on the streets to protest police brutality. The president spoke yesterday and said that, remember those young people who wanted to come to Abuja to remove me? And literally wanted to change the narrative that those young people who were speaking up about police, police brutality were basically about regime change and were literally criminals. So we have to keep records. I think the second thing is to also, and, and I know we say this a lot, or to begin to do it, to work across silos. There is so much knowledge within civil society about technical issues, about historical facts. One country has gone through what you're going through before. So the more we reach across silos, 
the more we're able to exchange knowledge and work together. Uh, and I think the third, which I've learned a lot over the last 18 months, is to when we are on our campaigns to look for friends within the camps we're campaigning uh, against their actions, within government, within platforms, and within other actors that we believe need to do better. Because reality is that many times, those on the inside need our actions and need our support to make those changes happen. So I think with these three things, uh, we may have a chance, you know, we document history, we reach across silos, and we work with people uh, who are able to help amplify what we're saying and get them to the level of action. Mm -hmm. such, such sage advice. Thank you, Benga. And, and I agree that this, you know, when you put those three things together, actually, when I think about the victories that civil society has had, and actually I heard one of the panels, a woman from India who's a, an advocate, and she's like, I've never actually won a case. <laughs> <laughs> but there's been a number of learnings in all of the cases, digital rights cases that I've been engaged in, and we've had micro wins. But but I do think that that the the when we do win, it's when we actually work with ourselves as civil society, and then with champions within government and within the tech sector, and they do exist. It's that it's that multi stakeholder campaigning that I think has been our most successful strategy. And we're never gonna be able to go it alone. As you say, we need to work across silos, but not just across silos within the human rights community, but across silos within all, all sectors. Um, Mariam, for you, um, reflections. Hi, I'm so appreciative of all the panelists and just the narratives and the testimony. And that's one of the things I, I do wanna also emphasize is that documented all. Um, these are testimonies, these are evidence piles, um, these are going to help us get accountability, but this isn't just about the ethnic cleansing I face as a Palestinian, this isn't just about um, any of the violence, even in Nigeria or in Kashmir or in Bahrain or in the US. It is also about the violations happening from these tech companies. So let us document those now as well um, for the future. More than this is, yes, this usually happens in other places before it comes home. So let us look at what is happening today because they will set the precedent for the future. If we continue being censored, we will be used as a precedent um, for policymakers to continue that. If we call it out, if civil society calls it out and calls it by its name and calls it clearly, then we will set a precedent for future wins. Um, uh, as well. And more than this is to continue using these spaces as, as places to reimagine um, and dream together. One of the hashtags Palestinians used was tweet as if it was free. And for the first time here in Palestine and in diaspora, I was able to dream with Palestinians um, despite being fragmented. So it's important to, for civil society to take up these spaces um, and, and demand that right as well to come together. Thank you. I, I really, um, I, I love what you said about precedent setting because I feel as though we're in this norm creation stage. And if norms get created without our precedent, um, if norms are being created, <coughs> you know, in multilateral bodies where civil society has been excluded, then, um, you know, it forms the basis of practice going forward. And because we are in this norm setting stage on so many issues, like if you look at the norms around, you know, around AI, um, which are happened to being developed in Europe, uh, similarly in Europe on the Digital Services Act, you know, it's all these norms that are being set and they're actually, they're really just precedent for future actions and future activities. And if we get the norms wrong, um, we get we we lose the possibility for social justice and for for, for human rights implementation. Um, so thanks a lot for raising that. Let me hand um, lastly to Jawe and um, let's have your perspective on thoughts, advice, um, reflections for civil society going forward. Yeah, I think to echo something that Benga said earlier about protocols, I think especially the engagement of civil society, both on 
you know, issues of policy, but also on the protocols and the standards building, um, both, you know, um, on a technical level, but also um, thinking internationally um, feels very important. And I think, too, another thing that I would touch upon is this idea of change and visibility. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. And there's so many, um, you know, differing levels of push and change that's happening. And oftentimes, the movements that you can't see, well, you can't see them for a reason. Sometimes you have to keep it underground. Um, and yeah, this is like very much coming out of um, thinking through the workers um, at these tech companies who are building change from the inside. Um, it maybe can't be visible yet, but it's happening. Yeah. Uh, for, absolutely, and and you know, let's pay tribute to to people on the inside, and many of those people on the inside are actually here at BrightsCon as well. They're here to learn and to hear directly from the voices and the expressions of um, of civil society and of individuals who are working on the front line. And while we're at it, and more importantly, let's pay tribute to those people who are on the front line. Uh, again, many of whom who are here. I talked about BrightsCon at the beginning of this. Um, at the beginning of the conference, um, you know, feels like three months ago, but it was five days ago, where I talked about, um, you know, about civil society um, being able to feel like they have a place which is home. And I hope that RightsCon can continue to be that place where people feel comfortable be being able to have these discussions. Um, I've, I've, the last point that I would like to make just in terms of the next 10 years is the fact that we're going to have another billion or two billion people join the internet community. And I think that provides us with a huge amount of opportunity and hope because this is a whole new generation of young people who are entering into our community, but also people who are being brought into connectivity of all generations um, because of you know new broadband, new mobile technologies, et cetera. And I just hope that we can welcome them into a, a secure and open and interoperable and safe internet that they can be part of um, and that they can shape. Because as we know, and the thing that, the real reason for RightsCon, which is where we started, which is how do we ensure that we're able to exercise our human rights in the digital environment, in the digital era. And we're right at that precipice now. So with that, thank you so much to the three of you for being on the panel with me and for being such awesome superstars. You really like give us hope, I think, for an inspiration to 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 be able to navigate what I think, I think Ben, you said is like difficult waters or choppy waters or, you know, whichever, whatever the, 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 the weather um, it is that it's going to be before us, but it is going to be choppy and it is going to be turbulent. Um, but I think when we have leaders such as yourselves to help guide us and to be part of our community, then we should be, we should do well and we, and we should do safely and we should do happily. And I think, as I said, like uh, in the opening, like don't panic, we're on it. So with that, uh, let me hand over to, uh, to Nikki. And and to, and, bef and Nikki, as you join the screen, thank you so much for everything that you and your team have done to put this together. Maybe we could have a round of applause, even though we can't see the audience. Um, but I'm, I know that people are clapping to say thank you to to, to the RightsCon team for putting this great thing together. And hopefully next year, um, when RightsCon happens, um, we'll be in a position to be even better and stronger and um, more connected. So Nikki, over to you. Thank you, Brett, and thank you for supporting and stewarding RightsCon the last decade as its co-founder and as executive director of Access Now. Uh, thank you also to the RightsCon team, uh, the tech change team, the technical moderators, all of the people who worked tire tirelessly behind the scenes to bring this event to, to everyone here. Uh, and thank you to each of you for organizing sessions, speaking, participating, and bringing the program and platform to life over the last five days. I hope all 9,120 of you, which yes, that's the final number of registered participants, were able to find a sense of community at RightsCon. 
Uh, we're already seeing the results of our connecting and coordinating too. Um, we're seeing coalitions strengthened and started, uh, petitions, initiatives, and reports launched, and then also toolkits created. Uh, and I'm sure that there are many more that we don't even know about yet. Um, so I invite you to share them in the chat if you have outcomes uh, and also email them to us because I know you know how to get uh, in touch with us. Um, I think that these tangible demonstrations are really uh, an illustration of the power of convening, even in the face of continuous disruptions to our civic spaces. They really make me hopeful for the decade ahead. Speaking of convening, I'm sure many of you are wondering what our plans are for 2022. Uh, and we're still doing a lot of work to understand what a return to in-person might look like and when that might be possible. And we're really hoping that you will all be a part of shaping that understanding by taking our survey, which is now available on the homepage of the platform and sharing your experience um, with this year, telling us what we can do better and what you loved about RightsCon, um, but also sharing with us your vision for next year. So uh, I, I really hope everyone will just take a moment or two to, to fill out that survey. Um, and as always, any decision that we make about where RightsCon comes together will be grounded in our commitment to hosting a summit that is as accessible and inclusive to, to a global community as possible. So we will keep you updated, I promise. But for now, you have our word that RightsCon will definitely come together in 2022 again. And so on behalf of the entire RightsCon team, we hope to see you there. Back to you, Javi and Melody. Wow, a lot of expectation for next year, right? Yes, Javi, maybe you want to have a go and show the example to everyone watching us right now uh, and who I'm sure will be very enthusiastic about taking this survey. By checking yourself, what is your vision for RightsCon next year? Ah, that's a, that's a good one. I've been preparing that one, I must say. Disclosure, disclosure is needed. Um, my vision for RightsCon, wow, I think it's, I hope for a hybrid, increasingly inclusive space, right? Uh, as we have seen, you know, seeing it grow online has been amazing with people that otherwise wouldn't have been able to join in person. So that I think is very, very exciting. And uh, I think that we should go for a place that we own that, you know, that is a node for convening and that is a tool for change. That's how I see it. How do you see it for the future? Yes, yeah, something very similar. And it's very interesting because you mentioned uh, inclusion. And earlier I was reading um, that when we talk about inclusion, we very often uh, consider the representation aspect and enlarging representation, which I think Redscon has been really good at. But we not always talk about the power uh, uh, impact and, and the, the power dimension of inclusion. And I think this is something that I would really want to, to see manifested at Redscon. We talk a lot about civil society and sometimes the imbalance between states and, and companies and civil society. And I would really want us to feel like we have power, that we are part of this change that we want to see and that we are um, shaping. So yes, that would be like my uh, vision of, a, of an next RightsCon. And I think we have started all of the initiatives that Nikki mentioned are just the demonstration that there is actually significant and tangible uh, initiatives that come out of these summits. And yes, but I also know that we are tired. We don't have the same resources. So <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely a rights con where we feel, you know, like resourced. And um, I don't like to use the word empowered that often, but I think it's really key <laughs> in that case. Absolutely. Inclusion for a reason, inclusion for change. OK, with that, it has been our great honor to have you all with us. So see you next year. Bye, everyone. See you later. Bye, everyone.